I'd like to turn your attention to our panel of experts. Tuning in from Mayaca City, Florida, we have Caitlin Kenny, our curator, curator of primates, and Lauren Arshakuni, our senior primate keeper. And also in Florida is Dr. Eric Patel, LCF's conservation and research director. And our very special guests tuning in from Sambaba, Madagascar, is Mr. Jocks, the Madagascar program manager, Mr. Arnaud, the community health manager, and Mr. Charles, our forest monitoring manager. So our diverse group of staff members, both here in Florida and in Madagascar, are dedicated to the preservation and conservation of the primates of Madagascar. Through our combined efforts of both in situ and ex situ efforts, LCF helps to hopes to allow lemurs to survive and really thrive for generations to come. So I am going to turn it over to Dr. Patel and our wonderful team on the ground in Madagascar. To everyone for joining us today. I'll just briefly review um, our Madagascar programs and then we'll turn it over to our primary participants who really run our office in Madagascar. Um, Lemur Conservation Foundation has maintained a staffed office in the northeastern city of Sambava since 2016, which has grown now to include four full-time staff members, myself included, and dozens of part-time Malagasy residents as well who we work with on a periodic basis. Mr. Louis Jox Jalfano, or Jox, who will be speaking today, leads our office, and we're in almost daily contact. Most of Madagascar's remaining rainforest is found in the Northeast, in Marojeji National Park, Anjanahari Bay Sud Special Reserve, and the Makira Natural Park, which are all in relative proximity to where we work. Uh, these protected areas are among the largest, least disturbed, and mountainous rainforests in Madagascar. Marojeji is actually part of a World Heritage Site, which includes uh, six other national parks in Madagascar. Um, Marojeji is a World Heritage Site because the biodiversity is so high, with more than 1,300 plant species, 84 of which are only found in Marojeji. In addition to 11 lemur species, the park contains 119 bird species, 74 amphibian species, and 84 species of reptiles, which is actually higher than any other protected area in Madagascar, according to Steve Goodman's latest protected areas book, which just came out. Our conservation programs, which are based on the IUCN Lemur Action Plan, emphasize ecotourism, environmental education, research, park and lemur protection, reforestation, sustainable livelihood, and population health and environment programs such as family planning. Our ecotourism projects have included rebuilding the dining area and the bungalows at Marojeji's Camp Mantella, as well as, as, well as construction of tent shelters, a dining area, shower, and, and a toilet for Camp Indri, which is the sole camping site for Anjanahari Bay Sud Special Reserve. These camps not only bring tourists and researchers, but give local school groups a chance to view exceptional wildlife in primary forests during overnight field trips, which we often lead with local students and teachers. To help preserve the biodiversity of these mountainous rainforest habitats, we work in collaboration with a variety of local NGOs, including Madagascar National Parks, who are the primary authority protecting these reserves. We work with them to conduct forest monitoring, lemur surveys, and park boundary demarcation. We also support nurses from Murray Stopes, who provide family planning counseling and services in remote areas that don't have access to healthcare. Finally, to fight deforestation in the region, we manage a reforestation program directly with local reserves and also Grand V, um, Missouri Botanical Garden and several other partners. And we also have a fairly active rocket stove program in which we provide fuel efficient cook stoves provided by the Swiss Malagasy nonprofit organization, ABES. Um, without 
further ado, let's get to our primary participants and um, start asking them some questions. And hopefully there'll be time for some audience input as well. Um, why don't we start with Mr. Jocks? Jocks, uh, if you don't mind, um, could you tell us a little bit about how you first got interested in conservation and environmental protection of the Marojeji region? Thanks a lot for the uh, important question, uh, Dr. Eric. Uh, <clears throat> when I was 13, I came to join my brother who worked for the WWF uh, at that time. So hearing them talking about environment conservation in Limerick, that was like a dream for kids to hear all those words. So uh, I was lucky to meet Mr. Bruno, who is a Ch half Chinese Malagasy, who owned a restaurant in Andapa. He invited me to join Alliance France's group. So I joined the group. And then later on, I started to organize a trip to Marjorie National Parks. So I was among the first student group uh, to visit the Narjit National Park in 2000, 2000. So we were voluntary students. We work to clean the bungalows. We varnish all the trees and then all the roof of the bungalows. So we are like two days visit and one day for voluntary work. And then after a few years, when I, got, when, I, when I went to university, I was leading the student group to replace Bruno when he could not go. So after that time, it was like a patient for me to share and to bring students to Marujiz. That's fantastic that you were one of the first students to go on one of those student trips and that it seems to have contributed to your long-term interest and now your career in the region. Um, do you, do you feel that ecotourism is helpful to this region? Well, ecotourism is very important for Sava region. Uh, we have four national, sorry, we have four protected areas, which are very big. So to protect these areas, we need then ecotourism. So developing ecotourism is then a key not only to protect the forest, but to also uh, uh, help local people by giving them uh, money, I mean, giving them more work, a source of income for the local population. So it is then vital for the conservation and then for the uh, lives of the community around the protected areas. And how has it been this year? Because normally, um... September, October, November is, is the height of the tourist season in Marojeji with hundreds of people usually coming. Um, but what about this year? Yeah, unfortunately, due to the COVID-19, we did not receive, I would say, any visit this year. We had probably like, I don't know, very few on the beginning of the year, but then after April, uh, we are no tourists. Hopefully, uh, they will come back again. Oh. And do you think that improving some of the tourist infrastructure, as we have been trying to do, do you think that will help bring people? That help a lot because we start to have like tour agency coming with the coming with the tourists, and they feel like the infrastructure that we have at Marjit before was not really uh, uh, good for them. So they kind of asked if, if there was an improvement to do. So the new infrastructure that LCF has done will be very good for Marjit and then for tourists who are coming to Marjit. Thank you so much for your thoughts. Um, we'll have more questions for you in a minute. Um, but uh, let's ask Mr. Arnaud here, who's our um, family planning manager, who works with the nurses that we support. Um, Arnaud, can you tell us a little bit about LCF's family planning program, or as we call it, 
the Population Health and Environment Program. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Eric, for this question. Um, well, um, Limer Conservation Foundation has supported family planning program in the Sava region, Madagascar, for several years now through a close collaboration with uh, Maristops Madagascar. LCF's main intervention zones for family planning services are in all areas around Marjid National Park and in the Nahar Beshid Special Reserve. LCF focuses more on remote villages for some reasons, one of which is because local communities living in such areas do struggle from family planning needs. Every month, LCF carries out family planning services within at least four different villages by transporting Maristops nurses to educate local communities about all kinds of contraception methods and freely provide treatment to those who are in need of the service. Actually, we only offer long-term contraception methods, which are implants, three years of protection, and IUDs, 10 years of protection. These methods can be removable anytime the patients would like to seize or switch the option. Um, the short-term contraception methods, however, are always available in any local hospitals and even community health agents can already provide it to the local communities. Um, finally, we integrate our environmental, um, our environmental education program into our uh, family planning program, where we highlight the linkages between the importance of uh, conservation, um, environmental con conservation and uh, family planning. About how many villages um, have we treated women this year? Uh, from uh, February 16th uh, to this day, we have treated um, 1,017 uh, women within 30 villages. Wow, that's, uh, <laughs> you have the latest figures. That's fantastic. That's much higher than, than even last year. Is that right? Yes. This year is the highest. That's really encouraging that even during a COVID year where most programs have shut down, we've actually exceeded some of our goals. And only because we have outstanding staff like you and Jocks and, and Charles, unfortunately, uh, who is our forest monitoring manager is trying to connect but he just had a new baby boy and he's in Madagascar's capital. And I'm not sure if we'll be able to see him today. But um, Arnaud, um, also, um, how, some of these areas are quite remote. How, how far away do you travel with these nurses? Um, one of the furthest uh, villages we have gone to this far was uh, in uh, Antahabroka. So it took us like um, like uh, two days or even more to walk um, on mountainous and uh, 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 rocky roads. Wow. And had anyone in those communities received this type of health care in the past? Uh, since it is remote village, um, we, Limer Conservation Foundation, has been one of the uh, one of the organizations who uh, provide um, healthcare in such um, uh, remote areas. So we have been the first uh, so far. This is why our results in those uh, remote areas um, are always good. You told me once about a very interesting personal experience you had during one of these remote missions. So could you share that with us? Of course, with pleasure. Um, yeah, one of my important uh, personal experiences when for the first time of my life, I had um, delivered a speech in public about the LCF family planning program in front of roughly 1,000 people. This was difficult for me because uh, I used to be more of an ex 
introverted person and not really used to speaking in public. Um, this took place in Andrahanj, a remote village uh, near Marujades National Park on World Environmental Day in June 2018. I was leading um, our family planning team, Marisops Nurses. Um, um, in fact, it was our first time to this location. Um, it took us like a full day of um, travel in cut cut track and um, uh, motorcycles as well, as well as walking to get there. So as I am handling uh, the program, I must be the one who launched this speech, informing the communities about who we are and what types of projects we support in the Sava region. And most importantly, our family planning. Um, and finally, I have to tell them um, which date we would return um, to bring our health care. I always remember back then, I even had to ask for help on how to really start a speech in such case. Thank God um, we did it. I can say um, almost 80% um, of the local communities know about, has learned about LCF and know about what we do as well as um, informed of our coming back um, to provide um, our uh, health care. Some weeks later, July 20, July 22nd, uh, 2018, uh, we came back there. Surprisingly, this was one of the first awesome results we've ever had before. 65 women implemented implants that time. Marisops nurses were running out of product. Um, there should have been even more than that number if they brought more. Currently, I feel that I have become more extroverted and outgoing, and I am proud of being community health manager for the American Conservation Foundation in Samba of Madagascar. Thank you so much, Arno. I'm sorry that we didn't oh, prepare goodness. you to have to speak in front of a thousand people <laughs> um, on the spur of a moment, but you it's did right. <laughs> tremendously. Um, um, it looks like Charles is having a little trouble connecting. Um, Jux, can you tell us a little more about the, the forest monitoring program, which, which Charles leads? Yes, thank you. So the uh, forest monitoring program led by Charles. So we bring, working with Madagascar National Park, so we patrol around uh, one site, uh, mostly MNP and us, LCF, we choose a site and then we organize everything with them. So we will bring uh, CLPs, like the uh, local forest policy, uh, forest police. And then we came with gendarme, like the ar army. And then we came with our team, LCF team, and then MNP team. So in one group of uh, monitoring forest, there are like eight, 20 to 30 people for each group. So they go far, very far most of the time uh, to check the forest, to check everything, uh, to check the disturbance about uh, inside the forest and inside the park most of the time. Last year was the first year when Maro Jeji, when one of our park rangers was actually shot and killed by a bushmeat yes. hunter. Um, yes. Since that happened, we really increased our, our monthly forest monitoring program with up to 20 people, including representatives of five different local authorities. Um, what are some of the primary sources of habitat disturbance inside of Maro Jeji that we have found? So, so far, uh, we have uh, nine types of disturbance, but mostly we have selective logging, uh, TAVI, uh, and then uh, we also have mining, illegal mining in Andana Basin Special Reserve. So those are like the three main uh, uh, disturbances that we have in those uh, two yes. areas. And Tavi is a is a, a local word for slash and burn agriculture. Yes, it is. It is. And is it primarily for rice or not only for rice? So now. Mostly it is for rice, but we started to have people uh, cutting 
uh, and then uh, planting vanilla. Right. Thank you for pointing that out um, because we did find, we were surprised to find uh, an increase in the number of illegal vanilla plantations inside the park. And when Jox is talking about Tavi or slash and burn agriculture, he's talking about um, burning of forest inside, inside the World Heritage Site. Um, we're running near the end. I, I wonder if we should see if there are any audience questions before we run out of time. We're going to go ahead and transition to our dedicated staff members here in Florida. We do have a beautiful 130 acre reserve here in the United States, which is currently home to 50, sure. 50 <laughs> individual lemurs of five different species. Um, we are an association of zoos and aquariums certified related facility. And although we're not open to the general public on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, this certification does mean that we provide the gold standard of care to our Lima residents. And so let's turn it over to Caitlin and Lauren. Uh, the first question I have is for Caitlin. Um, with there being over 100 different species of lemurs, why does LCF here in Florida only care for five species? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, lemurs are exceptionally diverse. As Katie said, there are over 100 species. Um, one of the main reasons that here in Florida, we only care for five, um, a big reason is that a lot of those lemur species are very specialized to their habitat, um, such as the critically endangered silky shafak. And they're just, it's not possible to keep them in a managed captive setting. So um, for species like that, it's all the more critical that we continue our work uh, in Madagascar, conserving the habitat that they live, because it's, that's the only way we're going to protect these species is protect where they are and protect them in the wild. Whereas the five species we have here um, are a little more adaptable and um, are able to live in a setting such as this, um, including in our free ranging forest habitats here in Florida. Um, and can you just let everybody know what species we do work with here? Yeah, of course. So here in Florida, we have ring-tailed lemurs, red ruffed lemurs, common brown lemurs, collared brown lemurs, and mongoose lemurs. And the red ruffs and mongoose are both critically endangered species. Excellent. The next question I have is for both of you, but we'll go ahead and start <laughs> with Lauren. Um, how did you get started in this field? How did you become a senior keeper here? Did you specifically go to school for it? Or how did you end up here? Um, yeah, so I actually went to school in California, um, Sonoma State University, and I majored in anthropology. Uh, a lot of my concentration was on biological anthropology, so a lot to do with primates and evolution um, and even primate ecology. Um, so after, towards the end of my um, senior year, I did an internship with um, Oakland Zoo and um, I had met a keeper at the San Francisco Zoo during one of my school projects studying gorillas. Um, and when I spoke with her, I realized that I wanted to be a zookeeper. So that's why I decided to do an internship at Oakland Zoo to see what animal care actually was at um, an accredited zoo. And after my first internship, um, I really enjoyed it. And it was um, a wide range of taxa, but there were primates on the string. Um, I then decided to do a heavily primate focused um, internship on a different string. And after that one, um, I decided to do an internship with LCF. Um, so I did a year at Oakland and then I came to LCF for um, a three month internship, which then turned into a seven month internship, which then turned into my a primate keeper position and now senior primate <laughs> keeper. Um, so I've been here for four and a half years, but uh, growing up, I always knew I wanted to work with primates and that I always wanted to take care of animals. 
Um, so yeah, I definitely always knew that this was the field for me. Um, so I'm definitely happy to be in it. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> what about you, Caitlin? How did sure. you come to be the curator of primates <laughs> at LCF? Um, my road was a little less direct than Lauren's. Um, I did not know this is what I wanted to do with my career. Um, I actually, when I first started uh, in college, I was a music education major um, and it was really fun. It just wasn't quite the right fit. So I then switched over to conservation and wildlife management. Uh, and as part of that program, I did um, an internship at Buttonwood Park Zoo in New Bedford, Mass. And then I also volunteered at Elmwood Park Zoo in Norristown, Pennsylvania. And then I ended up down here at LCF. Um, I also started as an intern and was hired on as a keeper and have made my way up to curator. So I've been here for almost eight years. Um, it was not my intention to work with primates or lemurs in specific, um, but once I started here, I fell in love and I haven't left. <laughs> Thank you, Caitlin. And I was hoping we might be able to hear a little bit from Dr. Patel as well. Um, you play a unique role at LCF in that you work in our base here in Florida, but you also primarily helped to manage our Madagascar programs. How exactly did you get your start in the conservation field? Yeah, it was uh, kind of a winding route. Um, I guess the most formative experience I had was that I went to India after college. Uh, my dad is from India and I saw a lot of monkeys there and I thought they were the coolest things ever. And I really enjoyed traveling in a developing country. And then I started, I finally took a biological anthropology class and I loved it. Um, and uh, I wish I had just continued on the track I was on, but I ended up switching to psychology, but it took me a long time to finish my degree. But in the end, um, it all worked out. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd highly recommend being a field assistant. Uh, that was something I did several times. I was a, a field research assistant for other grad students and for other professors. And that was the, the best way for me um, to learn about what grad school would be like, the challenges of being a grad student, and the type of data that you can collect um, in the field. Thank you. Um, and I know we have a lot of students joining us today. And I was wondering if anybody had any advice for students looking to break into this field. What, what do you think is one thing that um, these students should know? Um, I would definitely say talk to everybody and anybody. So if you're just visiting um, a zoo, talk, maybe find somebody that works there um, with the animals if that's what you wanna end up doing um, and see if you can talk to them or you know, find somebody that does work there and ask if they can get you in touch with somebody. Um, honestly, talking and putting your foot in the door is the biggest step, I would say. Um, networking is really important, but also just applying for internships or even volunteer positions, um, just kind of seeing what the work would be like, because typically ugh, being a zookeeper is really hard to explain. Um, there's multiple jobs involved in being a zookeeper. So ultimately it might not be what you wanna do, but there are a lot of jobs at zoos um, or facilities that don't involve animal care. So maybe you wanna be part of that. But I definitely would just say, you know, applying for something, um, seeing if you like it or not, and then going from there um, would probably be the best thing to do. Um, I definitely agree. There, like Lauren was saying, there are a lot of people who work at zoos and conservation organizations that don't necessarily work in direct animal care. So if you're really interested in conservation and that part of it, but don't necessarily want to get down and dirty every day, um, there's a lot of routes that you can go and still be involved. You know, there are zoos, we're a little small to have <laughs> all specialized people here, but there are zoos that have just commissary staff and you just do you know, nutrition for the animals every day or zoos have um, a registrar and what they do is they keep track of records and they manage animal shipments and permits and stuff like that. Um, there are researchers at zoos. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different routes that you can go 
So don't be afraid to venture outside of the box of, of Zookeeper. Um, and also for, for getting a position, a lot of places, I don't know, maybe not a lot, but um, simply like, they're gonna want people who are interested and even doing something as simple as volunteering at a local um, cat and dog shelter shows them that you are interested enough to, to put in the time and effort to follow this career path that you're passionate about. Great, thank you. And I know um, Dr. Patel does work with several students um, for research over in Madagascar. Um, do you have any advice for students looking to get into the research side of conservation? Um, absolutely, uh, field schools are a great way to start. Um, sometimes um, zoos also have opportunities like our internship. Duke University Lemur Center has outstanding research internships. Uh, Primate InfoNet um, used to be a, a good place. I think it still is a good place to look for uh, field research assistantships. Um, sometimes you just have to volunteer, you know, and you have to um, bite the bullet. Um, in Madagascar, I usually recommend two English speaking organizations. Oh, well, of course, there's um, Dr. Patricia Wright's um, Centre Valbio research station where they have study abroads at least once or two or three times a year. And you don't have to be a Stony Brook student, I don't think, to sign up. Dr. Mitch Irwin used to offer an outstanding um, field school also through um, Northern Illinois University. Um, and uh, Seed Madagascar, um, S E E D, is a British based NGO that um, specializes in volunteers coming over for varying lengths of time and participating in research or building houses or other humanitarian um, um, goals. Great, thank you. Um, we do have a couple of questions coming in. Um, this one is for Eric or maybe even our Madagascar team. Um, have you seen the effects of climate change in Madagascar? Jocks uh, and Arnaud, um, what do you think about that? Yes, and you might need to have... unmute. Yes, so we have seen the effects of the climate change in Madagascar. So now uh, the seasons are changing. So we have more, we have a long, like a long uh, period of dryness or uh, period when it is hot compared to what it was before. And also some rivers or source of rivers are not dry. So we see that the effects of the climate change in Madagascar. Great. Um, we do have another question. This one's a fun one for everyone. And we're gonna start with Caitlin. Do you have a favorite species or even a favorite individual lemur? Yes, <laughs> I think everybody does. Um, all of our lemurs here have their distinct personalities. Um, so uh, my, my favorite species that I work with here are definitely the mongoose lemurs. Um, they are, they're, they're just so interested in what you're doing all the time. Um, they're very nosy and it's just, it's really fun to walk by and they just want to know what you're doing. Um, but for individuals, uh, my favorite individual is a red rough lemur. Uh, her name is Ravina. Um, and I've, she's been here longer than I have. Um, but she was one who I bonded with during my internship. Um, and she's one that I like to think I still have a very positive relationship with her to this day, even though I'm not out and about there on a day-to-day -day basis like I used to be. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, we have red rum lemur. <laughs> what about you, Lauren? Do you have a favorite species? Um, I also really like the mongoose lemurs as a species, but I've fallen more in love with the red ruffs um, as I've been here. They are definitely the ones to lounge around all the time, um, which I favor. Um, <laughs> but I do have two favorite individuals here and they're both ringtails. Um, one is Molson. He is a free range 
male lemur um, in one of our forests. And the other one is a female um, Medela. And she is one of our expat lemurs, but she definitely favors me out of all of the staff. Um, and I think that just goes because I give her a lot of attention um, and I spend a lot of time training her. So I think we just have created a bond ever since I've been here. Um, but yes. <laughs> How about you, Eric? Do you have a favorite species? I have to say the silky safaka, um, just because um, they're the coolest things ever. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody from Madagascar want to chime in? Do you have a favorite species? I, don't know. <laughs> I would say mine is uh, Indri Indri. Um, I remember um, for the first time I found it. Um, I was, I, I was like, wow, because I, I, I've been told that it is one of the biggest uh, lemur uh, species. Um, so I was like, wow. And then also I love its vocalization. Um, it's so hard, loud, and I, I just like hearing it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I myself, I would definitely choose uh, Silky Sifaka. So for us in Sava, Silky Sifaka, I would say like very special. So for me, they are uh, my favorite. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, everyone. What about you, Katie? Oh, there's too many to choose a favorite. <laughs> uh, I'm not prepared <laughs> to choose just one. Um, all right, well, we do have another question. Um, we discussed a little bit earlier how important ecotourism is uh, for lemurs and conservation. For somebody who wants to visit Madagascar, are lemurs difficult to find or see in the wild? Um, usually not. Um, I'll, I'll just defer to Russ Mittermeier, who has um, frequently pointed out um, that um, lemurs are much easier to see in the wild than many other species of primates. And that's one reason why you should visit Madagascar. Um, it's also a very safe place. Um, they like Americans. Um, and there's a lot of um, beautiful national parks. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping that maybe Caitlin and Lauren can talk a little bit more about uh, the field schools that we offer here at our Florida Reserve. What's involved with a field school and um, what kind of activities happen during those weeks? Yeah, uh, so field schools are something we offer here in Florida, uh, and they're usually run by a particular professor based at a university. Uh, and it's the time, the length of field schools vary, but they're usually about a week long, um, maybe up to 10 days. It depends on schools and length of break and time of year, stuff like that. Um, but basically what a field school is, is we allow um, the professor to bring their students and they stay on site and they study the lemurs like you would potentially in the wild. Uh, so they do a lot of behavioral observations. And then we also offer additional modules such as um, a diet preparation. So they see what goes into the nutrition to take care of our colony. Uh, radio telemetry. So our free range lemurs wear a radio collar and each one has a unique frequency so that we can locate them out there if we ever need to. This is very similar technology that a lot of different organizations use on a lot of different species of animal too. Um, birds, primates, mammals, uh, all sorts of stuff can get telemetry. So learning how to use telemetry in a controlled setting like this maybe you really want to redirect your path and do research that involves telemetry because you think it's so amazing. Um, so there's additional uh, things that we as staff can work with the students on in addition to their behavioral observations of the lemurs. 
I think that's about it. <laughs> that's a great summary. Does anybody else has anything to add? All right. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have another question here, and I'm going to direct this one maybe to Eric. Um, how is the use of single use plastics and other waste addressed in uh, ecotourism in Madagascar? Is there, do you see a lot of uh, plastic waste, um, it, especially in areas where there are a lot of tourists? That's a great question and something which, you know, has not been addressed enough. Um, waste disposal in Madagascar is complicated as it is in many developing countries. Um, no, I, I can't say, because Maro Jeji only gets say hundreds of tourists and not thousands like Andasi Bay or Rana Mafana or Karindi. Um, fortunately, we don't see you know, huge amounts of plastic waste, but it is a real challenge because it's not safe to drink the water. And for many first time visitors for their own safety, they need to drink bottled water. I think we need to work harder um, to come up with ways. I'll give one example. Uh, there was a Peace Corps volunteer, um, and I forget his name, but a, a really um, dedicated young man who was based in Sambava. And before he left, he built um, a, a statue in the middle of a town square in Sambava made out of um, um, water bottles. Um, and it was massive, you know, and he just did that sort of as a, as a symbol of how we need to start paying um, more attention to that. But fortunately, we get a lot of ecotourists eco in Madagascar, and, and the foreigners are usually very conscious of that kind of thing. Nevertheless, uh, we need to do more about it. Um, recycling is not, um, has not gotten as far as it could in Madagascar. I'll leave it at that. Great. Thank you, Eric. Um, this next one is for our Florida team. Um, are lemurs friendly or are they dangerous to work with? What's the, the general consensus uh, on your day-to-day -day routine working <laughs> with these animals? Um, I would definitely say every day is different. Um, Lemurs are like us, you know, we do have good days, we do have bad days, um, and also depends on how they're raised, what environment they came from. So we do have individuals who are super friendly, but maybe um, we do have uh, younger individuals, maybe around two, who want to play um, while we're cleaning, but then we don't want to play back. So they can get, you know, irritated because we're not playing back with them. Um, so we just have to be really conscious of their behaviors um, when working around them because anything and everything can happen with any animal. Um, but we do have some ex-pets and because they were in a pet setting, they are extremely aggressive. We don't go in with them. We call them protective contact, which means that we never go in with them. They're always protected. We're not anywhere um, near them really. We shift them to do any cleaning and feeding. Um, we're protected contact when we're doing training or any kind of engagement with them. And they are aggressive because they were raised as pets. Um, most pets or pet lemurs are pulled from their mothers when they're young. Um, so they can't grow up in the correct setting that they need to and learn those behaviors. Um, lemurs are wild animals, so they should be never kept as pets uh, along with any exotic animals. Um, but yeah, so the behaviors are always different. We do, you know, have friendly lemurs, but um, they are wild animals. So there is that. Yes, very important to remember that lemurs are wild animals and they never make appropriate pets. Right, we have another question that looks like it was addressed in the chat a little bit, but I'm hoping Eric can uh, talk a little more about it. Um, we help support private land owners, private reserves in Madagascar. Um, can you tell us a little bit about why we do that and how it helps conserve lemurs? Sure. Um, for a number of years, we've been helping um, some local guides develop their own private nature reserves 
so they can acquire more land in order to protect it. And then even profit from the land by leading um, tour groups and student groups. Um, and uh, it started with one little small reserve called Desiree's Reserve on Tanatiambo, and now there are, are a number of them. So it's great to see that um, expansion. Um, currently, um, Mr. Jackson um, has a, a relatively new nature reserve, perhaps five to 10 years old near Marojeji's park entrance. And um, he's been um, buying little portions of land. We help him raise the money. We give the money to Jackson and then he purchases the land from his neighbors. And then we can then reforest that land because we have one of our best tree nurseries right there. Jocks has been really involved with that project. Um, Jocks, um, what's the situation now with, with Anola Kaley? Were, were we able to buy the, the last piece of land? Yes, thank you for the question. So we bought the, uh, the last one, uh, which belongs to V, next to V Reserve. So we got it. Uh, they are now working on the document. Uh, I think you just need like the mail or signature. Wow. So we got it. So Jackson. Fantastic. Fantastic. And it's actually connected to the main reserve, right? Yes, it is. It is. And is it totally degraded land or it has some forest? Well, uh, this one does still some forest, but not, I would say, we have to kind of clean some trees, uh, which are not like uh, invasive trees, and then replace them by new trees. That's great to see that, though. The, the, how pri private nature reserves um, can also contribute to conservation. That's wonderful. Um, let's, we're getting near the end of our time here, but I love to ask this question just because we have so many viewers and people are gonna watch the recording of this. If people want to help lemurs, what do you think is the, the best action or what's some action that somebody can take if they want to help either LCS efforts or uh, lemurs in Madagascar? Uh, do we want to start with Eric maybe? <laughs> do, you, do you have like a, a, what's something someone can do to help if they feel so compelled? Um, I usually refer people um, to, the, to the lemur action plan, at least as far as Madagascar goes, which had suggested three main things, ecotourism, um, long-term research centers, and supporting community management of forests and local guide associations. Um, and there was also an, a recent paper by Julia Jones in, which pointed out a number of suggestions for Madagascar's president, like addressing forest crime and addressing the fuel wood shortage. Um, um, but I'll leave it at that. And, but let's hear um, on, the, on the Florida side, what do you guys recommend? Uh, yeah, I, to go along with some of what Eric was saying, a lot of our conservation programs, as you've heard, in Madagascar are focused on addressing those concerns that Eric just mentioned. So another great way that you can help lemurs is by supporting LCF or by supporting another lemur-based uh, conservation organization. Um, you know, we have our on-site facility here, so you could help save and protect this, um, this insurance population, basically. Or additionally, you can help support our conservation programs in Madagascar and help lemurs where they live in the wild. Absolutely. Some of the captive management programs, the, the breeding that is done in Florida is absolutely critical for some of the species like mongoose lemurs. Uh, there are very few mongoose lemurs left in Madagascar. And I've been hard pressed to get numbers, but some have said as few as a hundred groups and the groups are small two to five individuals. Uh, Lemur Conservation Foundation in Florida has perhaps, I believe, the world's largest um, breeding population in one place of, of critically endangered mongoose lemurs. And uh, there are only, I don't know, less than 50. How many mongoose lemurs are there in the North American breeding population? 
Um, I think it's around 70 to 80. Um, I don't have the latest figures, but that's that it's more or less maintained the last several years around yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and here in at our reserve, um, we have for a long time, we've had about a quarter of that here on site. Um, our mongoose population is a little down this year because we've been transferring out um, a lot of our younger, now breeding aged individuals who were born here. Uh, we are working with the, uh, the, the AZA population to find them good breeding partners and set them up with those individuals. So we have sent out several mongoose lemurs in the past couple of years to go out and be new breeding pairs and bring more mongoose lemurs into the world. And only about 70 or 80 in the North American population. How does that compare to, say, ringtail lemurs? <laughs> yeah, so ringtail lemurs, there are over 400 uh, in AZA, in, uh, or just in AZA. So that does include a few institutions in Mexico and South America and um, Southeast Asia and Canada. Um, but you know, ring-tailed lemurs are that flagship species. They're very identifiable. Um, they also breed really well in captivity. So you're gonna find them everywhere. So they're very well represented. And within the AZA um, population, they're very genetically diverse. So that is a long-term stable population to maintain versus the smaller population of mongoose lemurs uh, here and in the wild, it, it's getting fairly, precarious for them. Um, Lauren, what other ways can we help lemurs? Um, I think just engaging in conversations like this and, you know, joining World Lemur Festival at any institution, um, just getting the education out there that lemurs need help um, is really important. So yeah, just conversations um, or even just volunteering somewhere if you have the opportunity to. Um, I know, you know, money can be tight for some people, so you don't always need to donate, um, but you can donate your time um, by either, you know, conversating or putting in some hard work. Thank you, everyone. And in this increasingly digital world, I did just want to say one of the best actions you can take right now is to be very mindful of what you're sharing on your social media pages. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, oftentimes cute images of people interacting with primates go viral. And seeing people touch lemurs, pet lemurs, is actually very damaging to conservation efforts. This type of imagery is taken out of context and there's research showing that it actually increases people's desire to keep these animals as pets, which is not a conservation goal. So be very careful about what you're liking and sharing on Facebook and just think about how your actions sitting at home in front of a computer can have very real consequences uh, to conservation efforts around the world. And with that, unfortunately, it looks like we are out of time. If we weren't able to get to all the questions today, I encourage you to pop over to our website at lemurreserve.org. And I do wanna take a minute to remind everyone that our virtual World Lemur Festival is still in full swing. And there are a lot of really great activities you can do in the comfort of your own home. It is an all digital event this year. We do have a digital escape room where you can earn a free raffle ticket to win prizes. We have a brand new virtual tour of our reserve and a lemur art gallery. <laughs> So while we are closed to the public, you can experience the magic of this reserve um, now online. And you can see all of these activities on our website, lemurreserve.org slash world dash lemur dash festival. 
Um, and as we wrap up here, again, I just want to give a huge thank you to our panelist experts, both in Florida and Madagascar. I know it's getting late over there, so we really appreciate you um, taking the time to sit with us here and chat with us about lemurs. And of course, I want to thank everybody that joined us today. Um, thank you and have a great afternoon or evening, as the case may be. Thanks, everyone.